Well, as I said earlier, we are just in the very beginning stages of a uh, series of messages on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, last week, um, we started off with uh, our Father, and uh, today it's who art in heaven. Uh, we learned last week how God's grace and holy love welcomed us into God's adopted family. And so this week, we turn our attention to heaven considering now the destination of all who can say with the assurance of adopted children, our Father who art, our Father who dwells, our Father who is in heaven. And I hope and I pray we all meet there someday to see if I get this message straight. <laughs> but actually a big part of what we do here at Coon Rapids United Methodist Church each and every week is to encourage you to book a flight to heaven. Ultimately, that's what we want to see happen with each and every one of us, our, our young people, our children, to book a flight to heaven. But we aren't there yet, so let's study the travel brochure that is before us this morning. There once was a boy who stood on a windy hillside. He was uh, flying a kite. He released, you know how this works, he released more and more of the string, and the kite went higher and higher until it went so high it was out of sight. And one of his friends came by and asked him how he knew that his kite was still attached to the other end. And the boy said, well, I know it's there because I feel it tugging on the line. And I think it's a bit like that when we try to imagine what heaven is like. We can't see it with our eyes, but we feel it continually tugging at our souls. And that makes us wonder about it and imagine and look for deeper truths. And so while time does not allow us to delve as deeply as we could into this subject, I do want to address a few questions that have come my way over the years and just draw from a number of biblical texts to gain some insight into heaven so that when we pray our Father who art in heaven, we have some idea of what this is about. The first question is, is heaven for real? Well, if heaven isn't real, then Jesus is guilty of committing fraud. Listen to what he said about heaven during his final meal with his disciples. He was totally I mean, preoccupied with the subject. He was about to go to heaven, but his disciples couldn't go with him until later. In the text we read, John 14, he compares heaven to a mansion with many rooms, and he says he's going there to prepare uh, his disciples' rooms for them. The next day, during his interrogation by Pontius Pilate, this kind of mock trial that was going on, Jesus confesses that his kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36. Later, we see him dying on the cross, and he turns to the criminal next to him and he says, he assures this criminal that today he will be with Jesus in paradise. Throughout his three-year public ministry, Jesus frequently spoke of heaven as the place where his father lives. We're also told that God is not alone there. In Nehemiah 9, verse 6, Nehemiah talks about the host of heaven a multitude of beings who surround God in worship of God. In Mark 13, Jesus talks of the angels living in heaven. So we know they are also there. The Bible tells us many times and in many ways that heaven is the place where all redeemed souls will end up. It's also the treasury in the next world where our spiritual rewards are deposited to await our arrival. So if heaven is not a real place, the Bible and everyone associated with it have pulled off a very cruel hoax. But if the Bible is true, we are left with no other option but to believe that heaven is for real. And for us, it isn't just the icing on the cake. It is the cake, the whole thing. It's all that we live for, all that we hope for. Question two, what will heaven be like? <laughs> I 
The late C.S. Lewis had this to say about heaven at the end of his Chronicles of Narnia. He uh, describes what the characters in his story experience when, when they enter heaven. This is what he writes. He says, the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful, I cannot even write them. And for this, for us, it's the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was really just the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover of the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has even read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. So Lewis tries to bring us closer to an attractive image of heaven, but it still falls way short of the Bible's descriptions. When Daniel, Isaiah, or the book of Revelation speak about heaven, they do so with an overwhelming sense of the holiness, the, the differentness, the, the otherness, the, 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 the sheer glory of God. When we say, hallowed be thy name, and that's next week's topic, so I hope you're, you're able to return here and, and join me in talking about that. But it's depicting this reality that is profoundly different than any reality here on earth. Isaiah saw a little bit of this when he saw God sitting on the throne. And he said, woe is me, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Or God telling Moses that he can't show him his face because the glory of God's face would literally kill Moses. For the prophet Ezekiel giving a glimpse of heaven's glory and saying it cannot be described even in human language. Resorting to inadequate comparisons with things of our world. The apostle Paul is granted some kind of visit to heaven. You can read this in 2 Corinthians. And afterwards Paul reports having heard inexpressible words which no man is permitted to speak. Elsewhere, Paul describes heaven as things which eye has not seen or ear has not heard and, and which have not even entered into the heart of mankind. And when he speaks about the Lord's coming again, Paul says, we will be astonished by what we will see. See, the thing is, in the Bible, the writers give us these pictures of the most beautiful things that they could ever imagine to help us just to get a feel, a sense, a perception of the remarkable reality that we call heaven. And they use images like streets of gold or, or pearly gates. I can't honestly say that these things really exist there, but I can say that the beauty and the value and the treasure of heaven will far surpass whatever gold and pearls and other sense of values that we attribute here on earth. Now, it's interesting, in studying the uh, images of heaven and the afterlife in the New Testament, the most common picture that is given is that of a banquet, a feast, a, a celebration, uh, a party, that is the number one metaphor used to describe heaven. And within that category, most frequently, it is the wedding banquet. Uh, John Ortberg talks about wedding banquets in the times of Jesus and before. Uh, this is a little bit of what he says. He says, one thing is most people did not have access to to good wine or good food. They, they lived subsistence lives. That is, they scratched and they eked out a living. They had just enough most of the time. But the occasion that you could actually get to go to a feast and feast like a king was when somebody was getting married. 
So the moment you give birth to a child, you begin to save for that wedding because you're going to throw a party for them. And not just a three-hour reception like, you know, we do, but really a seven-day-long party. And you invite all your friends and your neighbors and family and you serve them the, the finest wines and you serve them the finest food and you have minstrels entertaining and there's dancing and singing and laughing, not just in the homes, but out in the streets. And it's the most awesome experience of your life. And if you existed on subsistence living, when you talked about the high points of your life, it would not be a trip to Disney World. It would be a wedding banquet. And so we read these words in Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 6. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food. A feast of well-aged wines. A rich food fill time with marrow of well-aged wines drained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all people, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And then the Lord God will wipe away all the tears from all the faces. The book of Revelation paints the same picture when the new Jerusalem is coming down prepared as a bride for her husband. And so there is this wedding banquet for the lamb that occurs. And, and Jesus talks about a king that prepared a wedding banquet for his son and invited all the people to attend. This is the picture that we are given by God of what paradise looks like. And when I think about this, quite honestly, I think of my own children's uh, wedding receptions. Uh, they were married one year apart. It, it broke the bank for the UTEC family. <laughs> I mean, we used up all our savings to make the wedding feast the best that it could possibly be. And it was like magic for us. We fed people, we had music, we had the dancing and the songs and the, the laughter, and we joyed each other for hours. Those wedding parties were two of the best moments of our lives. And I think that's just a taste of what heaven is going to be like. And you can be confident that it exists. And that it will be the place where God's veil is lifted so we can see him and everything else exactly as it is. Question three. Are there different rewards in heaven? Oh my, and I could preach on this for a long time because it brings into focus so many other issues. But we'll just stick with the rewards for today. It's really an easy question to answer because the Bible does provide some basic stuff here. Scripture suggests we will not all be the same in heaven. Uh, this might be hard for some of us because we live in a time when we talk so much about equality and rightly so in terms of worldly government and, and being civil towards one another. We, we talk about equality and, and things of that nature. But in heaven, it's not the same as it is on earth. We're not all going to be the same in heaven. This might surprise some of us, but hear me out. On more than one occasion, Jesus states that not all who enter heaven will have the same degree of experience. This isn't to say that some have a less pleasant experience than others. For we know that there is no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But Jesus says that in his kingdom, many of those who have been first are now going to be last. And some who have been last are going to be first. Doesn't sound like equality. The way we think of it, does it? But what this is implying is there are different positions, different rewards. 
Friends, it would be awful if we're all the same in heaven. I believe that in heaven, each one of us is going to be able to be or do something no one else can be or do as well. In other words, we won't be just one of the crowd, indistinguishable or unneeded and just blending in. Our personalities will be intact, but purified by the fire of judgment. We won't be a bunch of pious zombies playing harps, wearing white robes, and just having silly smiles on our faces all day long. That would not be something I think I would enjoy. But in heaven, we will all be caught up in the joy of whatever it is that God has given each of us. Not in comparison to anyone else. Now, you've probably heard the expression, crowns in heaven. That's how the Bible describes the different rewards that God will bestow on us. There's only five that are really easy to find, but there might be others. You know, one of the crowns is the soul winner's crown. We can read about this in 1 Thessalonians 2, 17. It consists of of hope and joy and pride that comes to those who have led others to Jesus. And the church needs many, 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 more people to lead others to Jesus. And I hope that there'll be many who have the soul winner's crown. There's also the crown of righteousness. You can read about this in 2 Timothy 4, 8, which comes to those who have lived their lives in preparation for and anticipation of the Lord's return. This, this is a life that seeks out holiness, that seeks to live in purity and righteousness before the Lord. In, in discipleship where you're, you're sold out, you're all in for Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 4 talks about the crown of glory given to those who preach and teach God's word. Another is the incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians 9 for those who run the good race in the Christian life and are self-controlled in all things. This is a a perseverance, a, a dedication, a remaining faithful in the midst of odds and doubts, but you're sticking with it. You're staying the course through the ups and downs. And then there's the crown of life reserved for people who endure suffering in this life. And I would wage that that's probably every one of us. At some point, we'll have to endure suffering. And if you have to endure suffering as a form of persecution for your faith, even more so the crown of life for you who keep your hope alive for a better life that awaits you in the world to come. Each crown is different, and for all we know, there may be more. We don't know if there are others not listed in the Bible. The point is, we don't all get the same crown, and we don't compare ourselves anymore to one another. That will not be an issue for any of us. So I hope, personally, to get at least one of those crowns someday, but I'll tell you what, If I could have one crown, I'd make up my own. And it would be a crown that would allow me to sit in the back row of the church without having to preach a sermon. (laughs) Because I've had my time up front, I'm ready to step down one of these days and blend in with the heavenly host in the next life. That may not be your dream of heaven, but it's a part of mine. Heaven's going to be different things for different people. For some, it might be a simple thing like being able to bend down without back pain. How many of you? Or knee pain. Or suffering from some debilitating illness. Or having a disability. And being made whole. For others, it may be the luxury of a long, deep, undisturbed sleep. Then you can sleep all you want. Or play all you want. For others, it might be able to, being able to perform feats of athletic grace and strength. My, you know, my wife, when we watch the Olympics, we often just kind of close our eyes and imagine what it would be like if we could do those things. And I just keep saying, someday, you probably will be able to do those things. But not in this life. 
You might even wish you could eat or drink uh, healthily to your heart's content without gaining weight or feeling guilty. Maybe that Maybe that'll be a part of heaven. I don't know. You may dream of that perfect ski run through silky powder with no lift lines. In fact, there might not be any chairlifts at all. I'm hoping for a long conversation with Abraham Lincoln. And I want to sing next to Bing Crosby or Frank Sinatra. Or even the Beatles, assuming they all make it to heaven. I, I don't know. But whatever it is we're hoping for, I'm absolutely sure we've underestimated what God has waiting for us. What will we find there? It will be ecstatic. As Paul says, anything we imagine of heaven now is like looking through a dim glass. But at the moment we set our eyes on the face of God, every question we've ever had will just go away. Because in that moment, God's perfect beauty and perfect plan will be revealed to us and every other thought and dream we've ever had will fall to meaninglessness. But the finest thing about heaven will be finding ourselves safely back home in the arms of our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven where there is no more pain or tears or death or fear or sickness or war, no hate, no longing, no loneliness, no regrets, no envy, no strife, no negatives whatsoever. Doesn't that sound good? And it can all be yours. You know, every so often, somebody will sort of press in this question to me of why, why would I ever really believe in a heaven. Are you absolutely sure about this, they'll say. And here's my response. First and foremost, I believe in the resurrection and the life everlasting, and I believe in heaven as our primary residence, our number one citizenship. And it is there forever because Jesus believed it, and I follow Jesus. And the things that he says, I believe to be the truth. I believe Jesus came from God and that God was in him and that he is God and therefore I take very seriously the things that he says. Things like, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Or I go to prepare a place for you. And if I do, one day I'm going to come back to take you to be with me where I am. But you know, it's more than just talk for Jesus. Knowing that this is the singular greatest crisis that any of us will ever face when we face the death of our loved ones or when we face our own mortality, how do we cope with that? That we are marching toward death and someday we will be no more. Jesus said, let me help you with that. And you know how he helps us? He was crucified he died, he was buried, but then when some women went to his tomb three days later, the gravestone had been rolled away and they all of a sudden saw him and they touched him and they ate with him. And over the next 40 days, as many as 500 people saw him resurrected in different places all at the same time. And the disciples wrote these things down, and many died for this truth. They were martyred for this truth, that they had seen the risen Christ. And so Jesus didn't just speak about his resurrection. He showed us his resurrection. Look, here it is. This is what it looks like. And because I live, you can live also with me where I am. And this truth changes us. Friends, I not only believe in the, the resurrection of the dead, <laughs> I'm counting on it. And so I want to ask a final question of you this morning because I am a pastor. I want all of you to be in paradise someday. I want every single one of you. And I want your families and your friends and the people you are around every single day who you have an opportunity 
to bear witness to. I want them to be in paradise someday. And so I want you to know that you will be in paradise someday. So you don't have to be afraid. How do you do that? Because the one way that you can know for sure, according to the, the witnesses of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Paul and Peter and Jude, is that you will be in heaven. How can you know for sure? You put your trust in Jesus. We call him Savior for that reason, which is why I often ask those who are nearing their death, I'll say to them, are you ready? Are you ready? Because to be ready is to say yes to Jesus and to ask forgiveness for your sin and to trust him for what is to come. And if you do, no matter what you have done in the past, he is going to say to you, today you too will be with me in paradise. And so often, as I'm with somebody who is approaching that hour, I'll pray with them and I'll say something like, Our Father, you who is in heaven right now, into your hands we commend our souls. Jesus, we trust you as our Savior. Help us to follow you, to honor you, to live for you, to serve you, and to give you our lives. And somewhere in the midst of all that, we discover a peace that passes understanding because we finally know we are really, really ready. Are you ready? Let's pray. God, our Father, who art in heaven, thank you for this incredible hope and gift in all the various images and pictures and ways that we can think about it, not really comprehending it very much, but to know that there is some kind of existence, some kind of location spiritually where we can live with you and, and that our bodies will take on a whole new kind of a, a substance that, that lives eternally and, and that God, where our personalities are intact, and, and joy and happiness and peace and, and being able to relate to one another in ways we never dreamed that are so fulfilling and, and life-giving. People of all nations and races, and races and kinds and coming together because they are ready and they have said yes to you. Help us to be as much of that on earth as is really going on in heaven today. And to prepare our hearts. Oh God in heaven, we say yes right now. Yes, Jesus, forgive me my sin. I repent of it. I accept you. I receive your love and grace. Would you be my savior? And I give my life to you now. Prepare me, make me ready for an eternal life in heaven with you. In your name we pray, amen.